Right, okay, so hopefully you can all see um, my screen here. Um, this is training, uh, an introduction to delivering inclusive dance in schools. Um, really, really great to have you all here with us. Again, I've just mentioned uh, it would be great if you could just have your mute on. Now, we've requested that you have your video on, um, not necessarily for when I'm, I'm speaking, although it would be nice. Um, it's nice to see some human faces when I'm staring at my screen. Um, but more when, when we are doing some of the dancing activities, it might be nice for us to be able to see each other, um, sort of sharing ideas, etc. But also, um, if you have your video off and you decide that you're going to start swinging from the chandeliers or, um, you know, doing backflips, then uh, we can't be held responsible for any injuries uh, that, you, that you might obtain. Right, so ideally video on, but it's okay if you, if you prefer to have it off, that's fine. Um, also, I know a few people have emailed, said that they don't want to be on any social media or captured in any images, that's absolutely fine. You've got until the end of the session today as well, if you want to just drop me an email and let me know, that's absolutely fine as well. Okay, okay, so there's just a couple more people um, joining us and then we will get started. Okay, so we're going to be having a break about halfway through. Um, please feel free to ask any questions on chat. Um, there's quite a lot of us here, so I might struggle to, um, to address all of the, the queries today, but we'll certainly uh, get back to you at some point. And I've just mentioned there, just make sure that you've got a bit of space um, to move around. Right, so introducing myself, my name's Sarah Hawthorne and I am first and foremost, I'm a primary school teacher. Um, so I qualified as a primary teacher in 2013. Um, I'm based in the Northwest and I worked in Oldham for a long time. Uh, year six was my, my year group for a lot of years. Uh, before that, I, uh, from 2003, I was a dance teacher. So you can see where um, this is my real enthusiasm. So dance and dance education. Uh, more recently, uh, three years ago, I set up Primary Dance UK which is a company that aims to support schools to deliver high quality uh, dance education in school. Um, so I'm based, like I said, based up in the Northwest. Um, you can probably hear from my, my dulcet tones. Right, I'm going to pass over now. Um, Vicky, my admin, if I could ask you please to change the spotlight. Um, if I stop the screen share, if you could just change the spotlight to Anna James for us. I'm asking a lot of Vicky today. She's a... <laughs> right, I'm going to remove the spotlight from me, hopefully. And I'm going to try and find out. Ah. There she is! <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, so my name is Anna James, and I'm a freelance dance artist. Um, so I work for Dance Syndrome, so I deliver a lot of their classes in the community, in schools, in residential homes, um, we do all sorts and it's fantastic and you're going to hear more about who Dance Syndrome are as we carry on. Um, so I am based also in the northwest of Yorkshire, right on the Pennines, which is lovely and cold but also nice. Yeah. Um, so I deliver lots of dance in schools and also in the community as well. So today we're going to do some dancing. We're going to give you some exercises as well that you can always take with you when you're teaching, adapt them, things like that. But we'll, we'll be talking you through it. Don't worry. Um, and with me today, we also have a dance leader from Dance Syndrome. This is where we scout through all the different pictures to try and find our wonderful David. David, would you like to unmute yourself and say hello to everyone? Hello, uh, everyone. You know, my name is David Go. I am part of Dan Syndrome Leader. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. That's wonderful, David. And then we'll just get the spotlight back on to me. Wonderful. So you know who we all are now. So Sarah, Anna, and David. And I'm going to get just get back to my presentation. Okay. So um. Just to give you a bit of an idea what we're going to be covering hopefully today, um, we would like to encourage you to think about what your aims are, um, what you know, why you're here and, and what your hopes are for your setting going forward. We'd also um, like to talk about the barriers that your 
possibly going to be experiencing in your setting. Um, barriers to enjoying and engaging with dance for your pupils. And then we're going to start to understand how we can remove those barriers. So things that we can put in place, hopefully to make dance more accessible to all, uh, all pupils. And ultimately, um, how we can include uh, all pupils in dance. We are going to, as Anna mentioned, we're going to be learning some practical dance activities for the classroom. And um, right at the end of the session, um, I'll be sending you all of the activities that have been used today in the session. I'll also be sending you some um, useful materials for how to assess dance um, and some information on planning and uh, training materials as well. So um, I thought it might be quite nice, although now there's a lot more people than, than I anticipated. This is going to be really uh, interesting, but we would like you to see if you can find your annotate tool. Um, and I'd like you to, to, to hopefully mark my screen in a minute. Um, so to find your annotate tool, if you go onto your uh, view options um, and there'll, there'll be a sign that says uh, annotate and then you can select either a stamp or you can select a pen and once you've done that I thought what would be quite nice is for us to get a feel for, for who we've got here with us and, and what sort of sector you're working in at the moment. Um, so if you could get some sort of annotation tool, either a stamp or you could do a little dot or a cross and just put yourself somewhere on this, uh, this little graph and we can see where you have all come from. Look at this, wonderful students, straight away, all over it. <laughs> wow, okay, fantastic. If you haven't managed to find your annotate tool yet, don't worry, it is not an intrinsic part of the training today, um, but it's just nice for us to be able to do something a little bit interactive um, every now and then. Okay, right, I'm going to just take a little uh, screenshot of that because um, it's really good to know where you've all come from. Right, okay. The only thing is now I've got to save and I've got to clear. So last chance saloon now, if you are not in any of those, in those sections, like, well, mind you, I've got another, of enough. Put yourself in the other. And maybe you could tell me in chat where you've come from. <laughs> okay, last couple of seconds to scribble on my screen and then I'll save that. Perfect. Right, okay. All gone. When the kids do that, you can't stop them from drawing all over your screen for the rest of the session, can you? That's the trouble. <laughs> okay, right. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about... Um, about our aims for, for primary dance, um, what, what we aim to achieve. Um, and then that's going to hopefully lead us into you thinking about what you want for dance in your school. So firstly, I feel really strongly that, that all children should experience um, the joy of dance, including those from all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, I feel that Dance shouldn't just be confined to um, the weekend, you know, dance club that parents can pay for or the after school sessions that parents pay for. I think it should be an option for children to be able to enjoy street dance, cheerleading, ballet and um, in, in school, whoever they are and wherever they're from. Um, we also feel that the expressive arts needs to be part of the PE curriculum. So obviously in this country, dance um, falls into the category of PE, although obviously it is a creative art as well. Um, so it's it's really encouraging teachers, particularly those who are who are more sports orientated, to to pull dance into the PE lessons with just as much confidence as as everything else. Um, as a teacher myself, I feel really strongly that we don't want to be placing teachers under any more pressure. Um, than they're already under to deliver dance sessions. Can I just say well done um, for getting to the half term, everybody? 
congratulations. I hope you're all having a rest. What what a year. Um, well done for getting as far as you have. Uh, hopefully things are going to start to get a little bit easier. Um, and then, yeah, so my, my aim with, with Primary Dance UK is to provide training and support and resources. Um, because it was my experience when I was at school that a lot of teachers didn't want to touch dance with a barge pole. Um, and I, I totally understand. It's a bit like singing. It's a little bit like, for example, if, if you asked me to start teaching French, uh, I would laugh you out of the building. It's just one of those areas that if you're not confident and you don't have the experience, it can be so daunting. Um, and, and we're aiming to try and make it that little bit easier for teachers to deliver. So it's your time to write something down now. I would like you to think about three aims and ambitions that you have for your setting regarding dance. So if you just pop that on your pad um, in, in front of you, it doesn't need to be three, it can be more than that. But just really focus on your setting and what it is that you, you hope to achieve. Wonderful. Yeah, it's just it's just good to start some, some training like this with a with a clear sort of vision um, for, for what you're wanting to do and wanting what you're wanting to achieve. So once you finish that, that's wonderful. We'll we'll move on. So you get to use your little marking tools again now. This is exciting, isn't it? You're going to get to make a nice mark on my screen again. So we've got a little matrix here and I use this when I go and do training in schools. Um, and I find it, it's really helpful for us to all have a little think about where we are on this, this little spectrum here. So the, the yellow line going across represents knowledge of dance. So what I mean by that is um, knowledge and understanding of either dance itself um, participating in dance, teaching dance um, technique, for example, if you're quite knowledgeable and you feel that you've had quite a lot of experience in, in dance, either participation or teaching, then you're going to be sort of further along this yellow line here. And then the blue line uh, represents your personal, your levels of confidence. OK, so if you're feeling um, if you're one of those people who absolutely loves um, on a night out, getting up and going for it and shaking everything you've got, you're gonna be sort of somewhere up here near the top. Um, if the thought of dancing in front, even in front of your own mirror fills you with dread, um, let alone in front of a class of pupils, then your confidence levels are probably going to be down here somewhere. So, for example, me, I, I'm, I'm very knowledgeable. I have lots of knowledge and understanding, but it's been a, a year and a bit since I was in the classroom. So I'm probably hovering down here, sort of lower levels of confidence, but quite a lot of experience. Um, so grab your mark making tools, people, and put yourself somewhere on our matrix here. And already we have some a real combination. <laughs> Brilliant. This is great. So yeah, real combination of lots of different feelings here. Yeah, and, and it, you can just see here that it doesn't matter how, sometimes it doesn't matter how knowledgeable you are. Confidence um, for teachers can be a real barrier to, to delivering dance effectively. Just that, that feeling of, um, of getting up and doing it in front of people. Can, can be a real um, a real drawback. So yeah, completely understand. And I'm really glad we've got the whole range there. Um, you, you can see that you all feel very differently about it uh, and you've all got lots of different levels of confidence, levels of experience. 
Okay, brilliant. So just another couple of seconds and then I'm going to save this. And then if I'm really clever, uh, at the end of the session, <laughs> we're going to try and get it up again. Um, and we can see if we've moved or if we've if we've shifted or changed where we feel that we are on this on this matrix. But that remains to be seen whether I can actually get it up again. Right, I'm about to save it. Screenshot, save, done. Fantastic. Thank you for doing that. So I'm just going to clear all your drawings now. Done. Fantastic. Good. Okay. So one of the, the key things that we need to be thinking about here um, are why why are we why are we doing this? What are the benefits for the pupils of, of getting involved in dance? So we know from um, I'm, you know, years and years of research, lots of research done by large organisations like One Dance UK that dance has a direct impact on, on pupils' levels of concentration. And ultimately what that then does is um, helps to improve attainment. So the combination of music, um, movement, uh, kinesthetic and oral all working together is really excellent for, for concentration levels. And, and this is so poignant at this particular moment in time um, that, that dance and freedom of movement really improves mental health and well-being. We know that it does um, just from how we feel from, you know, listening to music and feeling like we can let our hair down sometimes. It has a really positive impact on mental health and well-being. Um, physical fitness. This is a really uh, important one because... In PE, there, there are certain activities that can sometimes mean that pupils are not necessarily um, moving around, um, engaging in high, high energy, high um, impact activity for the whole session. So if we think about something like rounders, for example, a pupil could be stood stationary if they're waiting to bat. Uh, or if they're fielding, they could be stationary for quite a long period of time during the session, depending on how the teacher's managing that. Um, the great thing about dance is that it enables every single child throughout that session to be engaging in high levels of physical activity throughout. And this is one close to my heart. So I was not a sporty child. Um, I couldn't hit a ball. <laughs> We didn't seem to have any hand-eye coordination at all. Um, but when I went to dance sessions, I really found something that I had a flair for and that I enjoyed and I loved. Um, so I went from not wanting to engage in any physical activity to wanting to dance three or four times a week. Um, so we're wanting to, to think about those pupils that aren't necessarily your super sporty kids, but that might really love doing something that's, that's involving dance. So again, just a little bit of time for reflection. You could actually put your answers in the chat here. It might be quite nice for us to all see um, what we think about this. You're welcome to either write it down or you can put it in chat. What are the benefits to dance um, for your pupils? So I think I've, I've worded that all wrong, but basically what are the benefits um, for your pupils of dancing and why is it important for your school. So think about your school in particular um, the, or, or the schools that you work with. Why is it particularly important do you feel that they get involved in dance? Just drop something down or pop something in the chat. I'm just going to have a look in the chat now um, see if we've got any ideas. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, fun. Fun is a big one, isn't it? Engaging enjoyment. Yeah, getting fit without realising. Yeah. Non-competitive physical activity. That again comes to those sort of sports, non-sporty pupils. And it was definitely my experience. I didn't want, I wasn't a competitive type. Um, I just wanted to, to have fun and, um, yeah, engaging socially. Help with expressions of emotion. Brilliant. Confidence, 
teamwork. Yeah, using all the muscles. I'm absolutely loving these responses. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you've got you've got a clear um, a clear idea actually of of why you need to do this in your school. Fantastic. So just a couple of more minutes to write down anything else, and then we will move on. Let's start doing some moving, hopefully. Okay, brilliant. Right. So. What we're going to do now is we're going to get on to do some copy and follow with Dan syndrome. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Anna. I'm just going to stop my share here. And Vicky, if you could find Anna for me, that would be marvellous. Uh, and then you're going to do a little bit of moving around. So just make sure you've got some space and I'm going to mute myself now. Over to you, Anna. Wonderful. Um, so before we get started, yes, just make sure you've got some space. You can do all of our exercises sat down. You can do it wherever you are in your homes at the moment. But if you also want to get up and move more with more space, then you can do. So with Dance Syndrome, we are an inclusive charity and we work with people with and without disabilities. Um, and we want to share our inclusive practice with everyone. Um, and we encourage everyone to make their own adaptations. So we're gonna go through a dance here now. We're gonna go through it in a moment. Um, but please make adaptations to suit your body and your space as well. Um, so for example, if I was doing a big, big jump here, whoo, um, but you might have a big light above you. So you might not want to do that because you don't want to damage your house. But also maybe your knees are feet, maybe you've got an injury or maybe they're a bit sore, something like that. Then we can adapt the movement to make it different. So throughout all of our exercises that we're doing today, we're gonna to show you some adaptations, but please also make adaptations yourself because the ones we give you might not be right for you. Um, and because there's so many wonderful screens on here, I don't think I can do 70 um, demonstrations for each movement, otherwise we'll have no time left. Um, so me and David are gonna teach you a part of a copy and follow exercise. Now, copy and follow is great um, because you're just getting people warm. You might use it for a warm up. You might use it for your main activity and you can use it where the teacher is the leader. So I could be the leader um, and me and David are going to be the leaders today on Zoom. And all of the dancers in your class, your pupils will then follow along with you. And if you've got some confident pupils, maybe they could take it in turn. They could always be the leader. So me and David are going to teach you one of our favourite dance syndromes, copy and follows. Um, it's to happier. But first, we're going to teach you the chorus and then we're going to try it with music. So I'm going to show you some standing up versions, but also some sitting down versions. Um, just because why not? Because I understand everyone's got different spaces. So our chorus starts by bringing your arms close in. Now in a classroom, it's common that you might find someone with a broken arm. Um, so remember, these movements can be adapted. If this isn't comfortable for you, you might just have your arms by your side. From here, we're then opening and closing all the way up to the top and then all the way back out. Nice. We do four to the top and four back down. Let's try it all together. Are we ready? Five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three. Four and back down one, two, three, four. Wonderful, really nice. David, would you like to show everyone the next movement where we push to the side? Can we put David on spotlight so he can show us this next movement? You can unmute yourself as well, Dave, if you like, to give instructions. There we go. So, this, I'm gonna do push aside like this okay then do a something like a wall push the wall into make it work from here to from here if you can't do that you can sit 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 down version just like me one 
then lean back, and two, and lean back, okay? Fabulous, yes, so that's the next movement. Um, and I can see lots of people practicing it. And yes, Dave gave us some great examples for sitting down. As well, you can make it simpler, more simpler maybe. You might just do the footsteps, or you might just do the arm, or you might do the twist as well. So there's so many different elements here that we can change. After we've done that, so we just do two, we go one and in, two and in. We repeat all of that again, but we've got the option of adding in a jump. So we add our jump to the side and then back down. If this is too much, you can carry on as we did. You could add in some bounces. And if you're sat down, here's my chair. If you're sat down, you can always bounce the knees as you go up. My chair's making squeaking noises. But you can always bounce your knees as you go up. And then from there, like David was showing us before, we go back to our push and in, push and in. Now, so that's our chorus. And for the rest of the dance, we're just going to copy and follow our instructions, our movements, and I'll also give you some verbal cues as well. So we're just gonna do this. I'm gonna play the music, we're just gonna do it. And then I'm just gonna tell you a little bit more about how we created this and what you can do to create that. So we're just going to go for a copy and follow or just quickly recap the chorus that we've taught you. We go out, 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 and then again, two, three, four, push and in, push and in. With a jump if you like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, push and in, push and in. Nice. So, when we're doing the rest of our copy and follow, just follow the instructions as we go. Um, let's go. Should we go for it? Is everyone ready? Make sure you've got space and have a sip of water as well. Oh, my coaster came with me. Have a sip of water as well if you would like to before and after. Um, we'll just do a music check, see if you can hear it. So I'll play a song. Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear this song. A thumbs up or a wiggle or something like that so I know you can hear. Can you hear music? Fab. Wonderful. So that's not the song, it was just a little test. So the song is Happier uh, by Marshmallow and Bastille. And we start, remember you can do it sat down if you like, just adapt the movements as you see me going. But we start still and we go with our arms as well. We do some twisting. Here we go. Lately, I've been, just stay I've still been twist. I want you to be happier. I want you to be happier. Ready, we're going to twist. When the morning comes, we we'll see what we've become. Make In the it cold bigger. light of day, we're a flame in the wind, not the fire that we've begun. Reach every it up. argument, and every down. word we can't take back. Reach Cause with all that has happened, twist. I think that we both know the way that the story ends. Paint the walls and reach up. up. Middle. It's Wait. eating me up inside. Wait, move we the wall. Force. We pretend it will Now if we jump together, at least we can swim far away from the wreck. Are we ready? We're gonna paint the wall. Here we go. Up well, high. high. Middle. I want to As change well. my mind. Cause this Speech just don't feel right to me. Two I high. wanna raise your spirits. Middle. I want to see Whoa. you smile. Moving in slow motion. How can you move in slow motion? 
thinking I want you to be happier I want you to be happier Bit bigger Even though I might not like this I think that you'll be happier I want you to be happier Ready reaching up to the sky one hour at a time Then only for the moment I want to change my mind Cause this is not feel right to me follow you're copying our instructions and like i said we we taught you the chorus you don't have to teach the chorus or part of the dance you could just say copy and follow and that your pupils follow along with you or you could teach them the whole dance but also this dance that me and david have just taught you we spent about eight weeks creating that so that was one hour a week well yeah one hour a week with a group of dance artists and dance leaders who work for Dance Syndrome to create that dance. So we got everyone's input to creating that dance. You can do that with your pupils. You could choose a song. Some schools have a class song that they have. Um, so you could create a dance to that. Um, or you could have a vote. You could always ask for song choices and obviously find the appropriate ones. Um, ask for song choices, do a little tally, which one do we like, and create a dance as a whole class. You could create it all by yourself, but also this is where primary dance or dance syndrome could help you out and could give you some extra videos and things like that, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, nice. So that's a copy and follow, and you can use that in so many different ways. Um, so yeah, take that as you like. Um, and thank you very much. We'll hand back over to Sarah. Fabulous. <laughs> That was lovely, wasn't it? Yeah, really, really great. Thank you so much, Anna. Right, so yeah, um, this can be a real sticking point for, for teachers sort of coming up with the ideas um, to create a dance, whether you want to call it a routine, whether you want to call it a sequence of movements, it's really tricky to come up with ideas. And, and sometimes we can ask the children to come up with the ideas, but they might find it hard if they've got, you know, not so many experiences with dance, it can be really difficult for them to just come up with something uh, at the spur of the moment. So um, I'm just going to come back to my presentation now. So hopefully you can all see it here. Oh, I feel much better after having a little dance around. You see, it, it does. It just makes you feel good, doesn't it? Um, right. So here um, I'm just going to share with you just a little bit, a mini video of, of how, how Primary Dance UK can, can support schools when it's when it comes to um coming up with ideas for dancers so um, i'm just going to play this short short video i just hopefully give you a little bit of information um about what we do Competition, our first online competition um, this this year, which was uh, brilliant, absolutely fantastic. Um, so yeah, so I'll just put our contact details on the end there. So if you feel that you need a little bit of support with um, with coming up with song choices um, and and choreography ideas, we we can help you with that. Right. So let's get on to now looking at um, 
barriers to dance what what your pupils in your school setting might experience um when it comes to dance that might prevent them from either enjoying it um or, or getting the most out of participating in the sessions so what i would like you to do is just again jotting down on your pad in front of you what groups i mean we're all from very different settings what discernible groups can you identify within your school not that necessarily would have barriers to to dance i'm not thinking um in that sense i just mean so for example you might say right well i can i can group boys and girls um you might say i could group um the pupil premium for example so just jot down on your part um the discernible groups that you can identify within your school setting or the settings that you work in um and if if you don't work in a school setting that's absolutely fine um you can you can just leave this section and i'll uh, we'll move on in a sec Okay, fab. So you will have hopefully a few, uh, a few groups written down there. So the, this was my thinking when I was sort of thinking about my settings that I've worked in. You can uh, group your boys and girls usually. You might have um, SEND pupils in your school. You could be thinking about your key stage three, key stage four, um, key stage one, key stage two or early years. You might have um, ethnic groups in your school, um, pupils who have disabilities, cultural groups, socioeconomic groups. Um, so whatever you've written down there that sort of makes up your school, what I would like you to do next is for each of those groups that you've written down that you've identified, consider what the barriers could be to those pupils participating in or enjoying dance. Now you might find some of the groups you don't think there are any barriers or you think there are very few, but other groups you might think, yeah, there are some, potentially there are some real um, barriers here. So just look at each of those groups that you've identified and just put a note next to it um, for what sort of barriers you think there could be for that, for that group of pupils. Okay, so so the first step really to to being inclusive is to be, be is to being aware of what the barriers are for the pupils that you're working with. Um, so what I've tried to do is is pick out a couple of the more common barriers that we experience in schools, um, and we're going to cover those today. We're going to hopefully give you some advice, some pointers on um, how we can get over some of these barriers. Um, and, and get you on those first steps to being able to deliver inclusively. Um, right, so one of the major barriers, and it's not just pupils, it's teachers as well, is overcoming difficulties with, with confidence and feelings of self-consciousness um, with your children. So um, traditionally you might say, oh yeah, girls, girls enjoy dance, 
yeah, my girls will enjoy dance. And what you might actually find is that it could be something that, um, that they find makes them extremely self-conscious. So we're just going to talk through this idea of levels of focus and how being aware of, of the levels of focus in your dance lesson can make it a lot more inclusive and comfortable for those children who are feeling um, who are feeling worried about it. But what we mean by levels of focus, so low focus is where there is no focus on a particular participant at any one time. Um, and if there is, it's for a very brief moment. So that would be if you were, um, for example, the copy and follow that we just did there with Anna, we end up the primary dance um, videos, for example, if you, were, if you were all joining in together there, then no one individual has got a level um, of focus on them. So we would say that, that that's a good place to start, particularly with children who have either not had much dance experience or who um, aren't feeling particularly confident. Then along with low levels of focus, you could also have passing focus where one of the activities that we're going to do next demonstrates passive focus really well. So this is where, as it sounds, focus is passed from one member of the group to the next, and, and it's quite brief. So this could be a circle game where um, the turn is passed on to different individuals within the group. Um, then moving up, um, as levels of confidence with your group uh, is building, we are looking at medium levels of focus where children might be for example, sharing what they've done in a group. So if you've asked them to go away and, and come up with an idea, then demonstrating that as part of a group to the rest of the class would be classed as medium levels of focus. Um, don't, don't start with that. I know one of the things that we, we tend to do is send them off in groups and then let's all share with each other. If it's the first couple of dance sessions, save this demonstrating and performing till a few weeks in um, at the very least. And then finally, we've got these high levels of focus where most or all of the group are looking at one, one person. So sharing a solo dance, for example. And as you can imagine, this is, this is for pupils who are feeling really confident, who've had lots of time to practice, who are really comfortable with the space and with, and with the dance. Um, so that's, that's sort of what you're aiming for really towards the end of a programme of dance, okay? So when you're planning your lesson, put in there, what level of focus are you going to be going for in this session? What's gonna suit the group that you're working with? We would advise um, that usually when you start in the, a dance unit, you would be doing low levels of focus or passing levels of focus to start with, and then slowly introducing those medium focus exercises. And we would suggest that high focus exercises, asking one individual to demonstrate something in front of the group needs to be saved until they're feeling confident under the, the conditions. So I did mention that um, we were demonstrating a really good way of doing some passing focus. So we're going to pass over and do a little bit of moving around again. I'm going to pass over to Anna and David. Hello everyone, wonderful. So we are going to demonstrate an exercise that you can use online because I know some people are still online with their pupils and we're doing so many things online at the moment. Everything is online, it's fantastic. Um, but then also how you can do it in the classroom, in the hall, outside. Um, so everything that we're showing you today, you, we can find adaptations for making this work in your different settings. So what we're gonna show you is plus one. Now, plus one is passing focus. So if I was in a hall and delivering this um, exercise, I would have everyone in a circle. And what we'd do is we'd go around and everyone would share a movement and you'd keep adding those movements on together. Now that can be done in so many different ways. Um, and it's up to you if you want to develop this, change this, but we're just gonna give you a basic version and also 
on Zoom, it's a lot different because we're not in a circle. I can't give us all a select order that we're going to go around because everyone's screens are different. So how we're going to do this today is to just do a short version and pinpoint the key things through the exercise. So plus one is essentially a dance exercise where you keep adding one movement on. So we're going to start this by finding our space wherever you are going to dance. You might be sat, you might be stood, wherever's comfortable for you. I'm going to stand. Um, so normally when I'm delivering this um, as well, I would always start as a teacher, especially if it's within the first few weeks. If it's nearer the end, we might go random, you're going to start it. And then we go all the way around. It's however you want to work it, but it's always great to start with the teacher or to start with the person next to the teacher so that it will always finish with you in control, um, which is always quite good. Um, so we're going to start this by I'm just going to show you a movement. This is just going to be a random movement that we're going to add on. Um, you might want to add a theme. If you're doing, if you're wanting to do cross curricular sessions and dance is part of your PE curriculum and you're wanting to do it about rainforests, then you could say, we need to think of a movement that is to do with rainforests. Um, so that's just a way that you could develop this or alter it to suit your class. But we're just going to do random movements. So the movement I'm going to teach you is going to be going round like this. So I'm bending my knees and I've got a wide stance. I'm putting my hands sort of relaxed on my legs, bending my knees and going round in a circle. Nice. Some ad adaptations for this, if you are sat, you could sit with your legs wide still and do over the top. You could always rotate the head, you could rotate the shoulders, because we're thinking about that rotation, that turn going there. Nice, that's my movement. and. We're going to do it for four counts. We go around one, two, three, four. Nice. So I'm just going to pick a few of the leaders that are with us today to show us a movement. So normally it'd just be going round in the circle or round the classroom from table to table. Who's next? So Sarah, please could you show me a movement? Okay. Can you see me? <laughs> Yep, I can see you. Okay, so I think I'm going to go for um, an elbow nudge. So I'm going to do an elbow nudge to the right and an elbow nudge to the left. So one, two, three, four. And then we could probably develop that a little bit more. If we wanted a bit more movement, we could do a little, a little rock to the side as we do our elbow bump there. Yeah. And we could also make it more straightforward. If we wanted to do it seating, we can just do that. Elbow one, elbow two. Fantastic. Right. Great. Wonderful. And on Zoom, we can also change the level of focus. So we could spotlight Sarah and then Sarah has got high focus. So that would mean now Sarah's got high focus, which could be scary for some of your pupils or even any of us. Um, but obviously Sarah is here and is aware. Uh, but we could also not spotlight Sarah and keep me spotlighted. And I could just watch Sarah on my screen so I could have everyone, so I can see everyone. And Sarah could show me this movement and then the high focus is still on me, it's still on the teacher, so the pupil doesn't go through that moment. Uh, but in a circle, typically when I've done this, the kids are loving it. They're going, right, it's my turn. I'm ready to show you my movement, which is great. But also you sometimes get maybe more shy pupils or not confident and really encourage that anything can be a movement. Looking up, can be a movement, waving could be a movement, doing a clap, doing a high five, a little bend, anything is movement. Even if they just take a deep breath, that could be their movement. So let me just show you Sarah's movement again. So she did the elbow to the side, elbow to the side. If you want to develop it, she mentioned going and taking a bit of a lean with it. Nice, and we can adapt this. So for example, if someone has got a broken arm, um, which I always see in a classroom, you could always just do the leg movement or you could make the knee go to the side. So that's just showing you how different body parts could still take place of that movement. Fantastic. So let's try it from the beginning. So we've got my movement and then we've got Sarah's movement. Are we ready? Five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nice, fabulous. Let's now go to Dave. 
David Cor, can you please show me a movement? You can unmute yourself, you can explain it if you like. Just think of doing this, why not take it low? Ooh. Okay? It's just it's a popular move, it's not. Oh, I like it. Powerful. How I can do break that down if you're doing like stand up version, now do maybe like a bend to your knee, maybe bend to your knee like this, or bend or to your feet as well, or it'll be a chair as well. It'll be from here. And maybe bounce up or bounce that way or bounce that way. You know, just hit in nice difference. But it's the same move as well. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Dave, can you show us that movement again? The um, main movement, the standing up version. Yep. So, my version is stand up. One, two. No. Nice, fabulous. Or um, you can do same same movement as this arm as well. Be one and two. And you get same movements. Nice. Right. Fabulous. So let's do that for four counts then. So we'll do one one side and one the other. And Dave gave you so many different options there to make yourself feel comfortable. If those weren't right for you as well, remember, keep adapt adapting them, adapting them. <laughs> so we're going to go from the beginning. So we go round and then we do Sarah's movement and then we do Dave's movement. Ready? Let's try it from the beginning. Five, six, seven, and round, two, three, four, elbow, elbow, Dave's down, up and down and up. Nice, really, really, really good. So, Vicky, please could you now give me a movement? You can spotlight or not spotlight, up to you. Nice. And Vicky sat down, so gr this is great. We can use lots of different adaptations here. So, what are you going to show us, Vicky? Nice, reach it up, reach it up, and pull it and pull it. Really nice. Fab. So we could do that standing up, doing the exact same movement. So we could just reach up, up, pull, pull. Nice. If going up is maybe someone's got some shoulder injuries or it's uncomfortable, you could always maybe take it out. Nice. If you are sat and again, there's uncomfortableness <laughs> with shoulders, you could always try it with the legs. <laughs> you got to step out, step out and in. Nice. So there's lots of different adaptations there. So I'm going to do a standing up one and go in, reach, reach, pull in, pull in. Nice. Let's try it from the beginning. Ready? Five, six, seven, eight. Round. Two, three, four. Elbow, elbow, drop, drop and reach, reach, pull, pull. Nice. Let's just try that with some music because it's good to just add on some random noise for the background. So we're going to put that on and then in a moment we're going to add on an ending position. Can you all hear this? It's quite fast. We'll give it a go. This is the timing. You can always challenge your dancers to do that more but we want to put on an ending position because that's always great and it's good learning for um well all dancers especially at primary school ages to know to finish their dance um, and not every dance ends with an ending position people go off stage people are still moving and maybe lights fade but it's always good uh, to get people to practice that when we finish we hold it 
and then we bow or we leave or whatever that is. So everyone, I would like you to think of an ending position and just do it. So it could be anything you like. It could just be very simple. It could be very complicated and everything is going in different directions. It's up to you. But I'd like you to show a movement and what David Carr is going to do is he's going to look through some of the screens you're probably not going to have time to look through everyone's, Dave, so just choose a few. And he's going to look through and choose one movement to then teach all of us to do as an ending position. So I'll just keep the music on. And if everyone holds their ending position for about 30 seconds, and then Dave will give us a thumbs up to tell us he's got something and then teach us. So everyone hold your ending position. moment. David Kaur, have you got one position to teach us all that you saw? Yep. Great. So David, if you want to show everyone this movement. Well, the ending position, the still position. Yeah, you know, really gorgeous is that just like freeze. Nice. Okay. And they're really good. They're gonna be a one up. Oh, just like, one. like bent. Okay, so let's have two ending positions then. Show us the first one again, Dave. Yeah, gonna be first one is one. And then show us the next one. Two. Nice. So shall we hold each position for four counts? I say three counts. Three, oh, yeah, yeah. No worries. let's do three then. So, yeah. should we try that? Do you want to practice it, Dave? Yeah, I'm going to just practice and break the moves down that as well. Nice, so let's hold our first ending position, everyone ready? Five, six, seven, go. Hold one, two, three, now swap. One, two, three. And that's going to be our ending position, she's going to hold this still. Very nice, thanks for choosing those, Dave. So now we're gonna do our dance from the very beginning where we go round all the way through to our ending positions. Nice. Are we ready, everyone? Remember, use those adaptations as we go along. Here we go. And then I'll talk you through a little bit more on how we can adapt it and things like that. There. So that's just an example on Zoom, how that could work. Um, I'm just seeing some questions here. So how could you add on in a circle with a large class of pupils as the one we have done? Yeah, perfect. So it could take your whole session if you wanted it to. So you could go all the way around your class of 30 pupils, or you could always put them into smaller groups and say they're going to do it. So you could always do a small one as a big group, so you could do an example so they see how it works and you start with the first four people maybe and then you break them off into groups and go right now you try it in your group and then you could end up getting them to perform it later on as the weeks go on this could be a really great way of creating the beginning of a dance sequence um, and then over the weeks as they go on you can develop those sequences that we've just done there we could then turn it into using canon so people start the movement a little bit after each other you can make sure they all do it in unison so at the same time you might add repetition in there you can add so many different things to just 
those four movements that we created then and the ending position um that that's all you could do for your whole term and keep adding to it and adding to it and then performing it at the end um, and are there any other questions on that as a whole as plus one um, obviously I'm here throughout so I can answer any of the questions on the chat um, but there's so many ways that you can do that and that could always just be a freestyle going round to start to get ideas so you might not add the movements on you might just go around and everyone has a turn at showing a dance move everyone copies them we go to the next person it keeps going around it keeps going around and then as a teacher you could be logging in some of those work some of those actions that you've seen and then create a dance from it that way um, so there's so many different ways, but today we just wanted to give you a little taster of how you can make it inclusive in your classroom, in the hall, on Zoom. Um, and obviously, if you want more of this, we can do more training sessions and things like that. Um, but thank you, everyone, and I'll hand you back over to Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, I was just thinking that. So, you know, in, in the primary setting, if, you, if you're doing a topic of animals, um, that would be a really nice one where you're passing... Um, to different pupils having a go at um, animal movements and that could be a nice way of pulling together an animal dance sequence. Um, thinking of maybe uh, in the secondary setting older, older pupils, I was kind of thinking of the dance dance through the decades, um, you know you could have somebody doing like a bit more of a 70s vibe and you could have something a bit more, a bit more ballroom position, for example. So yeah, you could really make that one work with um, whatever theme or topic you're doing at the time. Right guys, um, absolutely amazing. We're just gonna break for 10 minutes just to give everybody a chance to grab a drink, um, to go and recover from all that, all that grooving. Um, and we will be back um, just about quarter two. Okay, so we'll see you then. That was really good time in that break. The um, the bin lorry's just been right past my house uh, for the last ten minutes, making an absolute wreck. It so great timing. They've just gone. Um, yeah, grab yourselves a drink. Make sure you've got um everything that you need uh, ready to get started for the second half. Also, it's really lovely um having your comments in chat and just reading kind of all the different uh, obstacles that you're all coming up against given the current situation. I know that um. Oh, Les Leslie's got a bin lorry outside hers as well. It's very, it's very inconvenient, Leslie, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So we've we've got to think about all sorts of different things at these at this moment in time about you know viability of doing certain activities online, um, whether certain activities can be done outside. We were just talking there in the chat that um, speakers are actually one of the major problems. Well, the weather um, and and speakers and sound systems are, are the the main thing really to consider. Everything else can be done outside, providing they've obviously got the correct footwear on um, and that you're not doing anything that involves going down onto the floor. And, and obviously that the, the outdoor area has been risk assessed for the activity that you're doing. Um, but yeah, yeah, all of this can be done outside. And nice thing actually is that some, you know, the, the, the activity plus one that Anna's just done there could be done stood behind your chairs you know as, as long as perhaps you're just making the focus on the arms rather than the rest of the body it could be done stood behind chairs in a classroom <clears throat> right okay we've got some recommendations in the chat for some waterproof portable speakers if anybody's interested and i'm going to carry on now we're going to get on um with the second part of the presentation Okay, so let get your pen and paper ready. You might want to be taking some um, some notes for this next part here. So we've talked about barriers um, in as much as self confidence, self consciousness, um, and talked about ways to get over that is by being really careful with levels of focus and making sure that you don't throw anybody in there too soon because that that could put them off dance. Um, for many years to come. So it's, it's about managing and handling it really carefully and sensitively. Now I've just put um, a quote here on the screen. I really, really like this quote. The way people move is more than biology, more than art and more than entertainment. All movement must be considered as an embodiment of cultural knowledge, a kinesthetic equivalent to using the local language. Um, I found that when I was do, I was doing some research into um, cultural barriers to dance and 
it really made me think that as, as much as dance actually um, crosses cultures because it's the international language, isn't it, dance? Um, dance can also um, be, be a, a problem for, for certain people in certain cultural settings. Um, and if it's not done correctly, um, dance uh, from different cultures can be, can be done insensitively. So we're just gonna talk a little bit about that now. Um, so my school setting was over in Oldham. So I was at a school for many years in Oldham. This is my class, actually. Um, we, we had a great time. We did lots of dance in the classroom. But I did find that um, I came up against some resistance, sometimes from, from parents, sometimes from the pupils themselves, um, that culturally they felt that dance um, and singing as well uh, was not something that they in their culture should be doing. Um, so we, we had to think really carefully about this and we talked to um, our community liaison officer. We also did lots of work with parents. We made sure that we were very careful with things like music choices. Um, and we, we, we just did a lot of communicating with, with the community and we just made sure that we knew um, what those barriers were in order to start being able to overcome them. We ended up with a dance club, we ended up with a choir, which I also ran, and it was, it was wonderful. And we still had those children that didn't want to participate, but through communication and through being aware of the barriers, um, we managed to mostly get over some of those issues. So one of the first things I've just written on here as a point to consider is be aware of possible interpretations behind movements. Um, so for example, being aware of, of, of hip movements, um, being overtly sexual some, sometimes, depending on you know, how, how you handle them, um, certain movements can be construed in different ways. So just be careful with that. And if you feel that you need to adapt a movement for your class, um, then make sure you, you do that prior to the session. Um, being sensitive of music choices, I, I know it's something with, with Primary Dance UK, we ask the choreographers to, to listen carefully to lyrics, to consider the meaning behind the song. Um, a really good example, actually, the school that I work at um, in Hebden Bridge, which is in West, a lovely little town in West Yorkshire, um, we, we did a dance to Shotgun by George Ezra. And before we did the performance, it occurred to me that I just needed to explain that the term shotgun means riding in the front seat of the car, because otherwise these lovely liberal parents might think that I'm doing a dance, street dance with their kids to a song about um, guns. So I just, just to be really careful and sensitive of the lyrics in, in songs and the, the music choices um, for your session. No, but we all love getting on board with um, themed weeks. So you might have a Spanish week or you might be doing an international week. And it's great to pull in international dance. There is such a rich um, tapestry of different types and styles of dance that you could bring into, into a themed week. Just be careful. Um, if you're looking at, for example, um, doing Bollywood, Make sure you get someone involved who, who knows the culture, who can really enrich the experience and just be careful not to end up doing something that's a little bit stereotypical um, and not particularly well thought out. Okay. Um, as I've just mentioned with, with my, my school in Oldham, just be aware of the wider attitudes to dance within the school community. Um, and if necessary, do a little bit of communication with your parents um, about what's what's going to be happening in the PE sessions or, or whether it's after school. Um, and just to summarise, when it's done with sensitivity and an understanding of context, it's a great way of breaking down barriers rather than um, considering dance as a barrier. Um, that exists within communities. Sharing dance, music, culture is such a fantastic way of, of getting to know a different culture. Just be careful and make sure that you do it with, with sensitivity, with research and with support from your community. 
Um, and then we're going to do quite a, a large section here on, on the, the barriers for pupils who have different disabilities. And all of the content that we're going to cover here is um, being developed and researched by Down syndrome over many, many years. So when we're thinking about being inclusive with dance, there, there are four different main areas that we need to think about in terms of, of planning for inclusive dance. So preparing, making adaptions, communicating effectively and how we organise the room are all things that can make the experience inclusive for all. So looking first at preparation, how are you going to get ready to start delivering your dance session? You might be a teacher who moves between schools, you might move between classes, um, you might move between communities. Just be aware who is going to be in the session that might find it challenging physically and think about what is in place for them based on your understanding of what they need. You do that anyway. Um, it goes without saying it's always part of the planning who's going to be in this session but what we, we tend to think more um, in terms of you know maths or English or sitting down at tables think more about moving around and the physical aspects of a dance session if you are using a dance say from YouTube or if you're using one of our dancers make sure you've watched it through in full Make sure that you've recognised if you think there's a particular movement that might present a problem and just be one step ahead of that, ready with some suggestions um, for adaptations. And just think, does your lesson plan provide enough differentiation for your pupils? Um, make sure that if you, if you are copying a video type dance, you need to know how you're going to push those pupils on that need it and you also need to know how you're going to simplify that routine if necessary and we can talk about that shortly we're going to talk about how you can make adaptations to simplify things etc um, grouping pupils if you're going to ask pupils to work in groups I would suggest don't let them choose the groups um, you choose the groups and then hopefully then they're all going to get the best out of the pupils that they're working with um, so rather than go and, go and find a group, um, make sure you've prepared in advance which children are going to work best with, with which children. So moving over to communication. I know it sounds a bit obvious, but make sure that everyone can see the demonstration. And that's why circle activities are really nice. They can present the problem in terms of left and right, can't they? Um, but... Circle activities are a really nice way to make sure that nobody's stuck behind another person. Um, think about your own body language. If you're absolutely terrified of delivering dance, that might come across um, in the way that you that you stand in the session. So, um, you know, head up, shoulders back, um, make sure that what you're doing is really clear for everybody to see. And then using visual aids um, for pupils who aren't um, particularly good at knowing the left and the right. So you could perhaps put signs on the wall using um, numbers for the walls. So, or um, colors, be careful. Obviously, if you've got anybody who um, finds differentiating between colors difficult. But yeah, rather than saying left and right, try and use something to help pupils to know which direction you want them to move in. And, and really helpful is to use signs and signals and gestures. And even if you're not dancing, but if everybody's moving forward, you know, get those arms pointing forward so everybody knows which way to move. And really useful to communicate is to get pupils working in pairs so that a less able pupil might be able to follow um, a pupil who's more able. That's a really good tactic um, for helping pupils to learn and understand movement. Um, verbal communication, depending on who's in your class, just be careful of the words that you choose to describe a movement. Um, just as an example, for example, if you have a pupil who is using a wheelchair um, and you've got a movement that involves going forward, say move forward for four beats rather than walk forward for four beats. 
Okay, so just think carefully about those those words that you're going to choose there. And if you know that a pupil needs to adapt their their dance or a movement in their dance, think about whether that pupil would rather you spoke to them separately before the session about it. You know, maybe say, look, there's a movement in this that you might find a bit tricky. Uh, what should we do instead? Or some pupils will be really happy to say, no, I'm going to sort it out myself. Don't you worry. I'm going to come up with my own adaptation here. Um, so make sure you have that open discussion with, with any differently abled pupils. And I know, again, this sounds really obvious. Giving instructions in really small chunks is so important. One movement at a time. So like when Anna was teaching that, that um, dance at the beginning there, um, she only taught you the chorus, but you can imagine one movement, then practice it, then practice it to music, and before you move on to the next movement. So give them time to let that communication um, absorb before you give them any more information. Okay, organizing your space. Goodness me, you're all gonna be in some really different spaces now. You might be outside, you might be in your classroom, you might be in the cleaning cupboard. Um, I know how it is at the moment in schools. So let's talk about how we can arrange the room. First of all, think about your pupils who don't like that loud noise. Um, there are some pupils who are really sensitive to noise and that could be really off-putting. So think about where your speakers are um, and where your pupils who might not want that noise need to be placed. Formations are really important. Um, we've just mentioned there that arranging everybody in a circle is a great way of making sure that everybody's equal. We're all on an equal footing. We can all see each other. But again, I understand it's not great when you're all wanting to go uh, left and right. We can get a bit confused. So a semicircle is also good for that. This zigzag formation is really nice. If you can get um, the second row of pupils to be stood in between the pupils at the front. Do you know those little spots that you have for sports on the floor, they're like little rubber spots, they're really good. If you place those sort of on the floor in the formation that you would like the pupils to stand in, um, it's always a really good start. Cheerleading formations are great. In fact, asking the pupils to come up with their own formation for their dance sequence is a really good way of furthering the, um, the dance session over a few more weeks. Get them to come up with um, a formation and that's, that's the way that they stand almost like a team. If you search online, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of cheer formations. Um, round the table, standing behind a chair. Yeah, making adaptations so that a dance can be performed in a very small space in the circumstances is always good. Um, because otherwise, if you don't do any of those things, what we know happens is this little image here on the right hand side. So you'll have at the front, your really confident ones who are loving it right up there. They can see, they can hear, they're all going for it. And then you've got you, you sort of middle band who are really desperate to get involved, but they can't quite see, um, not quite sure what's going on. And then you've got your group at the back who are um, probably quite disengaged at this point uh, and probably prodding each other um, and doing things that they shouldn't be doing. So um, that's what will naturally happen. And we all know it. It's, um, it's what will naturally happen if you don't give pupils a spot to stand in, um, a place that's theirs. And think about you know, children who might just need that bit more space. Um, might need a little bit more room to, to move around. Um, when, when we've been doing the planning and preparation for this training, we've, we've been talking about what happens, what do we do if there's somebody who doesn't want to dance? Somebody who doesn't want to go on their dance floor, wherever it is. Um, and we've had lots of discussions about this. I mean, it's obviously in, in the primary setting, um, it's compulsory to do the PE curriculum um, and dance is a part of that. So if you have a child that's refusing to come and, and participate, uh, that, that can be a problem. What we would hope is that you've had enough time to 
have conversations with that pupil, find out what the barriers might be for them. And this is all the things that we've been talking about earlier. Each individual will have their own set of barriers. Um, you'll probably know who that individual or who those children might be who don't want to get on the floor. And what we would hope is that you would find a way of um, encouraging them before you actually get to the point where they're refusing to get on the dance floor. We thought of some other suggestions as well. Give them a job. Thinking about careers, creative careers, aren't just being the performer, are they? Give them a job that involves doing the music, for example, or having um, taking photographs. Um, give them something that starts to get them involved in the, the creative aspect of, of dance. I know there'll be loads and loads of questions about like, what do we do if somebody refuses? But we would discourage you forcing anybody to do something that they don't want to do, um, especially when it's quite a personal thing, isn't it, to each individual dance. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask us questions, hints and tips on how to encourage those people who, who don't feel that they want to or uh, are ready to dance. Okay, so again, looking at some other um, ideas for making sure that we can be inclusive when we're teaching dance. Making adaptations to um, pre-done choreography is really important. You might need to adapt a movement um, because of a physical difficulty. If, if so, think about, as Anna was mentioning before, think about the general essence of the movement. So I'm just going to think here about the idea of a roly-poly movement. So if I'm rolling my arms, I'm creating a rolling movement. That could be that could be done in a very small way. I could create that that feeling of rolling one finger around the other in on a very small scale. So think about the movement that you're trying to achieve and how that can be adapted and captured in a different way. You might still be able to use the same direction of the movement. So Anna demonstrated where um, instead of sort of swaying the arms from side to side, you might be able to take the head from side to side, but we're still going left and right. <clears throat> with the, um, with the, the arms, you might, you might want to use the feet instead of the arms. So again, using the essence of the movement, you could maybe, if it's a roly-poly, you could roll the ankles. So using the ankles to create a roll in action there with the feet instead. We could simplify a movement by taking out the arms or the legs. So for example, the movement where um, in the first dance that you did, that was a push to the side. When you step to the side, you could take the feet out of that and just use the arms. So that's a way of simplifying something. And remember that dance is more than just the physical activity of moving. It's about the music, it's about pom-poms, could be involving ribbons, glow sticks, flashing lights, you name it. I know that somebody in the chat earlier said um, that the kids just love it when you get stuff out. Even the older kids, when you're in secondary school, you get the pom-poms out, we're on, they love it. Um, we've worked in um, a, a special school recently where the, the majority of the people in the session were in wheelchairs or on walking frames, but the feeling of the pom-poms and having the music on and just feeling that against the skin was just a fantastic experience. So don't forget that dance is more than just the physical activity of movement. It's everything else that goes with it. And then finally, have an open discussion. I mentioned this earlier with differently abled pupils and agree on personalised adaptations. Um, they, as I mentioned, might want to make their own adaptations during the session. Give them ownership of that and, and ask them to come up with their own ideas on how they might adapt a movement for them. So we're going to get on to our final Let's Move activity now. Um, and this is ambiguously called the kitchen activity. So I'm going to move. I think you're already muted, Sarah. But hello. <laughs> hello, everyone. Hi. 
There you go. <laughs> Pass over. Um, so we're going to go on to the kitchen game. Um, now, this is a bit like um, what you want about the kitchen game. So I'm just going to talk you through a few levels of what on earth I'm on about. So it's called the kitchen game because when I first got introduced to it, it was about the kitchen, but you can change it to be about your theme, your curricular theme or something else. Um, and we've chosen the kitchen because we think that most people can relate to what a kitchen is and things that might be in a kitchen. So how we'd start this is we'd play a game. This is how I've done it before, or you can just go straight to the activity. So the game is, um, a bit like if you do the wrong one, you're out. So you can make it competitive because I know some schools still want to have a competitive element in there. Um, so this is how it works. You will have a leader, a caller outer person, and they will name parts of a kitchen. So for example, a toaster. So David Carr, please could you show me an example of how a toaster would move? Like what, what does a toaster do? So uh, toaster, like jumping. Nice. That would be like tall, yes, call toaster. Oh, your hand. That's nice. Yeah, no, just all different things. Great. Can you show us another jump? Can you show us another jump for a toaster? Yeah. Can be jump. Nice. Or just one. Great. Oh, and then the arm, oh, and then the arm, and then the Nice. Great. Fantastic, Dave. So you can see there's so many different examples there of how you could move like a toaster. And normally, as I feel like all of us would do, if someone said, what does a toaster do? Everyone's like, jump. They just start jumping. That's what your bread does. It pops out of a toaster. So we'd get everyone to move like a toaster and they keep moving until I say the next word. Um, so if you want, you could do this in different ways. You could set the movement for the toaster. So you could say that everyone in your class has to do a specific jump because you're working on something in particular. So you might want everyone to do the biggest jump that they could do or this is the one that I choose more often, um, is that everyone chooses their own jumps because then they have that ownership and they feel like they've got their choice. Um, so you give a bit of leadership to every person involved. So you say toaster and everyone just keeps jumping, however they like, until you say the next word. And the next word is microwave. And normally when I've said this, this is the response I'd get. The noise usually comes with as well. Um, so Dave, could you please show us some ways of moving like a microwave? Yes, of course. So there's um, like a microwave, it's just like a thing that just you heard, like spin, or your head as well, maybe head spin, or different ways spinning like your body. Mm, just like nice, nah, going round on the yeah, circle, but it's you know, still um, microwave. It's hot as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah so like or just spin, you know, different order of moves for for that. Great, yeah. So there's lots of examples there using different body parts to rotate. And as we are delivering, we've said microwave, but as you're seeing things happen in your classroom on your Zoom, you're going, great, that's a great rotation. So saying the action word as long as well as the microwave. Um, and then eventually you can take out the microwave and turn it into rotate. So we've done a toaster, we've done a microwave. Now let's do a freezer. Dave, what would you do for a freezer? Yeah, freezer like cold. No, like this, or cold, like you yeah, with your head, or your do that, like keep up, or just you know, do that, shake your cold, and just all, all different, all means for your freezer of the means, okay? 
Fantastic. So there's lots of different things that you could do for a freezer. So Dave was saying you could try and get yourself warm by hugging your body in different ways. You could try and warm up your body. You could also freeze and try and get everyone to freeze as still as they can. Or you might, you might put counts. So you've got to freeze. When I say freezer, you have to freeze for five counts and then you go to a different freezer and then you go to a different freezer. Um, so we're just going to use those three for today. So we've got toaster, microwave and freezer. You can keep going with this. You can add more and more and more and more. You can ask people for ideas. I've asked people before and someone came up with blueberries falling out of the fridge. You can get anything. <laughs> um, and with using the kitchen, um, personally, and you might have different thoughts on this, but I've never ha experienced someone say something that's inappropriate. Or I don't, I can't think of something that might be inappropriate. So when I was trying to think, well, what could be a difficult thing to approach? I was thinking, well, a knife, because they're sharp, but we're not talking about an actual kitchen. I'm pointing to my kitchen. We're not talking about an actual kitchen. We're talking about the movement. So if you have a knife, if someone's saying knife, then we're thinking sharp. We're thinking sharp movements. You might chop something. So... I feel like you can kind of make anything work in a way. You might experience other things, um, but always try and twist it as to if you if someone says an idea and you're thinking, oh, that's that's a little bit risky or in your head you're going, oh, oh my gosh, this could go into something else. Because sometimes we have that panic. Just go back to what is it and how can I move my body like that? That's all it is. So we'd play the game. So I'd go toaster, microwave, freezer, blah, blah, blah. If you're too slow or if you do the wrong one, you are out. And now kids do love a bit of competition. I mean, not just kids. Personally, I am rather competitive as well. Um, so some people love a bit of competition. And if it's in a PE class, you might want to be having some competition in there. However, you might also not want to do that. And you can go straight into the activity. Now, the activity from the kitchen game, I usually like to pair them together is we then create a dance from those movements. So I'd like everyone to find their space and join me in moving. Um, you can make notes as well as we go along, but we will be sending out a pack um, that has all of these explained on them, the exercises, and you'll be getting a few other things as well. Um, so we've just done the game. You were all incredible. We're all winners. It was fantastic, really well done. There were some great examples. We're now going to create a dance from there. So you could do this in two ways. You could get everyone to learn the exact same dance. So like we did in plus one, we'd learn the exact same dance. We went round, we did all of this in unison. That's when everyone does it at the same time. But for this one, you could also get everyone to make their own dance. So we could all start by doing a toaster, but everyone's toaster jump could be different but it's up to you how you want to do that. And today that's what we're gonna do. So everyone, I want you to think of that toaster. How does a toaster move? Just have a little play around. What could it do? How might a toaster move? What would you like? And obviously we might spend longer on this if we were in a classroom, but we're just showing you little bits today. And I want you to choose your favorite toaster movement, your favorite toaster movement. Um, I'm going to choose my shoulders, bouncing up and down and we're going to do our favourite toaster movement for eight counts. Eight counts. Are we ready everyone? Should we try it? If you haven't got one, don't worry. You can always copy my movements or use one of the examples from before. So let's just try our toaster movement. Are we ready? Five, six, seven, toaster jump. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nice, that's great. I've just seen all the screen going up and down. We're now going to go into the microwave movement. How could we move like a microwave? Have a little think. What could we do? Nice. I can see twist side to side. People going over. People going round. People circling their hips. Nice. There's a real mixture here. So choose your favourite one. And we're going to do that for eight counts. So everyone think of their microwave movement. I think I'm going to go around like this. Whoop. <laughs> so let's try our microwave movement for eight counts. Are we ready? Five, six, seven, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nice. Let's try it from the beginning. So we have our toaster jump, microwave rotation. 
straight from one into the other. Eight counts and then eight counts. There we go. Five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Rotate. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nice. We've got to add in our freezer now. So we had lots of options from Dave before, maybe trying to get the body warm, freezing, or trying to hug yourself to get warm. So I want you to choose your favourite one for eight counts. I'm going to try and get as much of my body warm as possible for eight counts, I think. I quite like that one. Nice, so let's just try our freezer movement for eight counts. Ready? Five, six, seven, go! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nice! Let's go from the very beginning. Toaster, microwave, freezer. Here we go, and then we'll try it with music. Here we go. Five, six, seven, jump! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Rotate! Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Get warm! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Fabulous! Let's put some music on, and this time, I'm not going to say anything. I'd like you to try and count in your heads. So it's eight counts per movement. If you're doing that with your pupils, obviously this would be over more and more time. Just want to give you little sneak peeks on how you can develop this. Are we ready? Oh, speaker isn't connected. Technical issues. There we go. Can you all hear that? Are we ready? Fantastic, just take a little seat, have a little drink, put your feet up. Um, so that is a way that you can get people to create their own solos from playing a game before. Um, and the kitchen game is great because you think that people will know things in a kitchen. Um, even using this uh, early years foundation stage, they will, they will or some may know different parts of a kitchen. You could talk about a spoon, you could talk about a knife and fork, a bowl, um, a cup. So really it could work with loads of different age ranges here. And also when using it with secondary school, sometimes they do think I'm too cool to play a game. I'm, I'm not a kid, I'm, I'm older, but everyone loves a bit of competition and also a bit of a chance to be silly. Um, so it does work quite well there as well. You can change it um, to be a different theme. So kitchen was great, but rainforests and um, pirates, you could say that we have to, um, the ship, we create a movement for the ship. We create a movement for an eye patch. We create a movement for a parrot. Um, so you could really change it up with the themes. And also with the game, as we were talking about before, people maybe not wanting to participate in lots of different reasons. When I've experienced people, um, maybe for the first time being like, I'm not doing dance, I, I don't do dance, the dance isn't for me. Um, and they explain this to me and I'm like, okay, that's fine, but we're gonna start by playing a game first um, because we're dancing, but it is also a game. Um, so I like using the kitchen activity um, in my first few weeks, or if I, I might change my plan last minute, if I know someone's going, dancing is not for me, then I'm like, well, we're going to play a game. Yes, they're dancing. And eventually they soon don't realise how much they're dancing and they just stay a part of the session for the whole time. Um, so I, I quite like tricking people into dancing without them knowing by going, we're going to play a game and do a dance game, basically. Um, and you can do that anywhere. Like then we did it here from homes. You can do it outside. You can do it in a classroom. In a classroom, you could always use the classroom as a theme. So people could look around and go, um, a tray, um, the register, the whiteboard, and do movements from that as well. Um, so that's the kitchen game, which you can change. But thank you very much, everyone. Back to Sarah. <laughs> thank you. That was lovely. <laughs> Did not know I was going to be a microwave today when I woke up. 
how exciting. <laughs> right, okay, we're just going to get to um, talking a little bit now about some adaptations um, and how we can how we can do that. Thank you so much, Anna and Dave. Right, so we've just finished our kitchen activity. Um, we're going to have a go now, uh, just the last section of our training. We're going to actually have a go at coming up with some adaptations of our own now. Um, we're going to focus on the, the dance that we did at the start of the session. So this is a real memory jog for you. Thinking back to the happiness routine that we did at the start, we're going to choose one of the movements that we did in that dance. Um, and I'm just going to pass over to Anna really quickly, just to just to remind us of a couple of the movements that we that we did there. Fab, are you wanting movements from any of the activities or just the last one? Which one? Just go for um, go for the happy dance. What it the happy happiness dance? So we had opening and closing, and I'm not going to give you any adaptations this time because that's your job. We've got opening and closing with the arms. And we also had our push to the side. This is the full movement. We did that twice. I'm showing you four times. And then we also had it with the jump. And there were some other movements that we did a few times where we had our reaches up on a medium level as well, nice and low. And just there you go. There's a few different movements for you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, what I'd like you to do now is um, I'm going to give you some ideas for how you could simplify that movement. OK, so you could whichever movement you've chosen, one of the ways you could simplify it is to take an element out of the movement. Either um, it could be a side to side movement that, that you just do on the spot. It could be you take the arms or the feet out of the movement. Um, you could make that movement simpler. Um, so less complex, you could make it less aerobic. So one of the challenges could be that, um, that, that pupils need to build up the levels of fitness. So think about how some of the movements that, that, that Anna was doing there could be less aerobic um, to start with. You could try and slow movement down. So you could do it at half speed. So instead of doing something quick, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you can go slow and slow and, okay. And the other thing you can do is isolate an element of your body um, involved in the movement. So just focusing on the hands or just focusing on the hips. So if you could just now have a little think, um, you don't need to demonstrate it to us. But I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes to pick one of those movements and decide how you would adapt it. And then we're going to talk about how we can make those movements more difficult. Okay, so I'm, I'm just thinking about this, um, this movement that we did with the push across um, and how we can actually do that seated, which we mentioned. We can take the side steps out of it. We can just do the arms. We can actually take the, the arms out of it and just do the lean, couldn't we? Just do the lean from one side to the other. Okay, so then there's other ways that we can um, actually add some more challenge, which is just as important as um, being able to simplify. You might have those pupils who really do need um, pushing on really to the next level. And it is really difficult when it's not your subject and it's not something that you feel particularly confident with. So think about, for adding challenge, think about changes in levels. That's a really good way of adding challenge. So the roly poly that I did earlier, I could do that up high and then I could take it down low. That gives me another thing to think about there with that movement. Not only have I got to think about doing the roly poly, I've got to think about adding um, 
adding some some level of movement high and low okay so any movement that you can do standing up you can also do sitting down you can do it crouching down there's lots of different ways you can add challenge by changing levels um, other things we can look at doing are adding more movements in so with um with the happier dance that you did where there was the arms were going one of the things you can add there was a jump which is what anna did the second time she did she did the dance so adding movements in is another way of adding telling adding turn is a real challenge that is really difficult for some children they can become so disorientated if you turn them to face a different wall in the room but do the same dance that can really throw them because the first time they did the dance they were moving towards the window and then the second time they do the dance they've ended up moving towards the door and that can be really a real challenge for them spatially so not only adding turn as in you know spinning or rotating a movement adding a turn as in a quarter turn so each time you repeat you know like a line dance each time they repeat the dance they turn a quarter okay or turn a half and then we've mentioned this adding an aerobic element to it that is instantly going to make it more challenging and increasing the range of movement so um anna and david did a really good example of that where um instead of doing the big arms we can actually decrease the range of movement to make that easier with much smaller hands um and it's more challenging with larger movements right Depending on how confident you're feeling with rhythm and timing, you could add more challenge by doing a double time movement. So thinking for my elbow movement that I did earlier, I did an elbow out and in and out and in. What you could do to add challenge there is a double elbow. So double, double in and double, double in. You can try and get more movements into the space of time there um which is again going to give them more to think about somebody suggested this to me as well doing it in reverse so doing a dance completely in reverse is great because they're then having to think back to front what did they do last that they then need to do first i quite like the idea of being rewind as well like you press the rewind switch on them and they have to do it completely backwards back to front um i like that idea a lot so again, just thinking about um, just a couple of minutes to scribble some notes there, um, thinking about the dance that you did at the beginning, what could you do there to add more challenge? What sort of things would you add um, to that movement? And then because we just get into the point where we're going to finish off. So um, what I would like just to finish with is, is a few suggestions for making your school um, a dancing school where dancing is part of not just the PE lesson, it's part of everything that you do. Um, so take a whole school approach to this, to valuing dance, to valuing performance in the arts. Um, a good starting point there is offering dance as a, a free lunchtime or after school club. If that's, if you don't feel you've got a teacher who's confident to do that, or um, you know, you, you're not at a stage where you can have people coming in to deliver dance, using something like um, Primary Dance UK videos or things that, you know, other, other things that are available to deliver a club using your, um, your, your interactive whiteboard. Don't let dance become confined to the school production. Think carefully about um, making sure that dance becomes a bit more part of the, the everyday at your school um make it make people who are dancers significant don't always just celebrate the the, the footballers um the athletes make dancers celebrated as well as part of those significant people in your school because it takes hard work determination incredible physical fitness to be a dancer and to be able to move for that amount of time with that amount of energy and that's one of the ways you can really push it um, when you look at male dancers in particular use those male role models um, that might really help your boys to get on board with with what um 
what a fantastic skill it is to have. So I'm just going to summarise everything that I've, I've talked about. Um, this is really an introduction. I mean, we've just touched the surface of, of starting to get you feeling confident with delivering dance in an inclusive way. But the main points to take away from this are building self-esteem and confidence will overcome barriers. Make sure you know what the barriers are. Make sure you have open discussion with your pupils, your communities, your parents about any barriers that you might think um, you're going to experience. Building up trust and that feeling of safety and um, thinking about things like levels of focus. If you thrust them into a really uncomfortable position too early on, unfortunately, it could be that dance is never something that they're going to feel comfortable with. And planning, um, so, so important. Thinking about meeting the physical, the academic, the social and emotional needs of, of all of the people in your class is, is key. Um, we're going to send you uh, in the next 24 hours, or maybe longer, depending on how efficient we can be, we're going to send you lots of really useful stuff. Um, and some of that involves measuring impact. I know that it's quite hard to measure progress when it comes to, to dance. So we're going to send some questionnaires for you, um, for your teachers. We're going to send some questionnaires for your pupils. And that's a really good way of measuring attitude in your school. So if you're bringing in dance as part of your action plan next year, for example, get the teachers doing a questionnaire and the pupils before you implement that in your action plan and then do one 12 months later. And that's a nice way of showing the impact. So I'm going to send you key stage one, key stage two and three um, questionnaire and also one for teachers. A really nice way of capturing enjoyment, get, get filming, get taking photographs, um, make sure you capture the sheer joy that comes from engaging in dance. Pop all those lovely images up around the school and on your website, etc. cetera. Um, keeping tabs on in levels of engagement is important. So keeping a register of your, your dance club, how many pupils are interested in participating in competitions, for example, um, I'm also sending you a load of assessment grids. So the first, when you open the document, the first two um, assessment grids are general, taken from the PE curriculum. And I've just pulled out all of the statements that are relating directly to dance. Then there are some more um, broken down focused assessment sheets, which are actually based around the Lancashire scheme of work, but can be applied to lots of other different schemes. Uh, all around dance and I've included a self-assessment pro forma for pupils and a peer assessment pro forma as well so when you open that pdf that says assessment it'll have all of that stuff in there okay um you can also um use I'm going to send you as well a just a little pulse rate and recovery record which is nice if you're doing particularly year five sixes and your secondary pupils if you want to get a little bit of overlap with science measuring heart rate recovery, physical fitness levels. Um, that's a really good way of showing the impact. So start, you know, at the start of the six weeks, what were the pulse recovery rates like? Um, and then did they improve over time? So yeah, lots and lots of lovely things to send you um, with your, from your email addresses that you sent to us. Um, what we've also covered today um, really relates to a lot of these questions, I collated these questions from um, what Ofsted have been so far been asking if they've done PE deep dives. So these references there to progression. So hopefully something like the assessment grids that I'm going to send might be useful. Um, how are you evidencing progress there? Um, how you're making sure you add challenge. So being aware of doing adaptations when it comes to dance and being aware of the need to add challenges is really important there. Um, and demonstrating progress. So all of the activities that Anna and David have done today are um, building on each other. So you start with something quite small and you can end up with quite a big, long, quite complex 
sequence of movements. And there, that is a beautiful demonstration of, of progress in dance. So here we are, everybody, and my technological um, restrictions mean that I can't actually find the, <laughs> the screenshot of what we put on here earlier. Um, what I'm hoping is that you're all feeling a little bit more um, knowledgeable and a little bit more confident when it comes to delivering dance and hopefully you've got some useful bits to take away with you so please just have a little scribble on my screen before I give you my contact details and we finish up so scribble away also um, I'm going to leave the chat open I'll be here for the next 15-20 minutes after we finish and I'm going to hopefully answer questions but if you want, you can, you know, send us emails, etc., and we can get back to you later. Oh my goodness, look at this. Look at us. We're all up there in that top right section. This makes me so happy. <laughs> Brilliant. And again, you've only just, you know, done a couple of hours there, but I really hope um, that you've managed to, to get something out of that. So I'm just going to take a screenshot of my little... So there's my impact. There's my evidence in. That, um, that, that what we've done today has been useful. And I'm gonna save, there we go. Fantastic, thank you all, brilliant. Right, we'll just finish off now, leave you with um, a few things that we can help you with if you would like. I better clear all your drawings, haven't I? That would be useful. <laughs> Okay, so um, we can help you if you need some more support. Um, Primary Dance UK will be able to provide you with um, videos and lesson plans, um, all designed by choreographers and then lesson plans written by primary school teachers. So we have a lovely combination of primary teachers and dance choreographers working together to create lessons which we can then video and our 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 choreographers break it down and teach it in, in nice small chunks and then I write lesson plans to go with them with creative suggestions for how to then further develop what they've been learning from the choreographers. We use pop music so there's street dance, cheerleading, um, we use acro dance is a style that we use which brings in gymnastics and acrobatic arts so have a look at our website or just get in touch with me if you're interested in finding out more about that. Um, <clears throat> we can also do training. So I can I can deliver training um, or one of our team can help me there in choreography or whether it's just getting the best out of our resources or developing something um, bespoke for your school. And Dance Syndrome are absolutely brilliant in what they can do. So they can deliver assemblies around equality, diversity, community and philanthropy. They can run workshops around positive health and well-being, transferable life skills, how we can use dance to communicate ideas and feelings, and also CPD for staff as well. Um, they do a fantastic um, training for, for teachers there for leadership, um, empowering staff to feel confident in delivering inclusive dance, and also just inclusive approaches to think about inclusivity in general in your school, not just, not just in dance. Okay, um, we've managed to put this on for, for free um, without payment because we're working with a fantastic charity. So we would really appreciate if, um, if you'd be interested in donating even just a small amount, a small amount to Dance Syndrome to, for them to keep up their fantastic work that they do. Um, in empowering people with learning difficulties to be able to lead uh, dance sessions themselves, which is just brilliant. Go on their website if you want to find out more about what they do. Contact me or uh, Dawn at Dance Syndrome anytime. We're going to send certificates, assessment materials and some really useful stuff for you. Um, and we just wanted to say thank you for taking the time out of your half term. Have a relaxing rest of your half term. It's so, so important chill out, um, recuperate, and let's see what next term brings us. I'm going to stay in the chat here. Um, if you need me for anything, please just get in touch. And thanks all again. And I shall just pass over to you to say goodbye. <laughs>
Yeah, sure. Well, it's been lovely to um, dance with you all, uh, to hear your conversations, to see the chat pop in. It's great. Um, thank you for all of your lovely messages in the chat. It's fantastic. And yes, please get in contact. Um, please get in contact with Dance Syndrome and with Primary Dance UK if you want further training um, or if you want us to do anything with your school or your pupils, anything that you work with. Um, it's been really wonderful. So yeah, we'll be here for the next 15 minutes or so if anyone would like to chat ask questions um the chat is going off which is wonderful uh, so it might take us time if you're typing for us to reply to everyone um but we will do we'll make sure we do but thank you all very very much um david Cole, would you like to say anything before we go do you want to say anything so just gonna say thank you so much for you joining yeah Training is really good, and I hope you nice half turn. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, David. Right, guys, and thanks everybody, and hopefully see you all again soon.